Testing, can people hear? Do you hear okay? It's not too loud, not too soft. Good. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Let's kill the upper overhead lights a little bit, all right? I want to talk to you about venous disease today, and why is it important? You're going to see a slide here in a few minutes that said, venous disease is the number four medical cause of death. Well, it's bumped up a couple, okay? So I want us to think about it, and there's still some lights on, right? There's right in there. There you go. Very good. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, so you know where I come from. Um, I, I did family medicine for six years in a little bitty town in northwest Kansas, which taught me about physical diagnosis and hands-on, because in my era, we had cling film, and an ultrasound van came through three times a week. That was it. Okay. So I couldn't waste money. I had to use my fingers and my brain, okay, to try to figure things out. And mostly what I did was call my friends and say, hey, man, I don't know what's going on here. Help me out. And we can still do that, okay, and that's really important, okay? So every single person that I see who I'm thinking about venous disease, I ask them about Vir Kao's triad. And I tell him about Vir Kao. He's a guy who lived in about 1890, and he said there's three reasons we get blood clots, okay? We damage vessels or we, yeah, and it can be anywhere. That could be in your shoulder and you can get it in your leg. You can do surgery. Anytime you damage your tissues, it sets off a complement activation system and you can clot anywhere. And I'll, I'll come back in a minute, okay? Hypercoagulability, we'll talk about that, and stasis, all right? So we'll talk about some of those. So estrogen, malignancy, obesity, COPD, and smoking, that's 80%. 80% of the people uh, that uh, do have hypercoagulability as a cause have that. Now, when I went to school, they taught us all these things in here. Maybe about 3% of us had a genetic predisposition that made us hypercoagulable. Now we think up to 60% do, okay? And that's going to become important. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, you know, all of you guys that are in the internal medicine are really smart. You know a lot about all that stuff, okay? We'll talk about it, all right? Now, in my world... And I kind of like to think of me as being a pipe guy, but I kind of have to play in the chemical world too, okay? Because I get a lot of people, I've got, I've got a genetic factor that makes me clot, but they have one of these, okay? None of these are independent risk factors for venous thrombosis, okay? These are, okay? And why, why is it important to know whether you're in the red zone? Kind of sounds like football, okay? Because these are the people that need long-term anticoagulation, right? And is that a good deal or is that a bad deal? Well, it's a bad deal unless you need it, okay? It's a good deal if it keeps you from having CE and dying, but 
especially in the warfarin era, about 30% of the people uh, to 45% of the people that tried to use warfarin, it didn't work, okay? Their INRs were 1.5 over 9 and any ER bleeding, okay? So, uh, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute, right? So just because you've got a, a genetic predisposition and, you know, those who worked here, I said, hey, have we, have we, have we done a, you know, hypercoagulable profile? Not all of them are as risky as each other, and I think that's a really important thing to point out, okay? What are the causes of stasis? Immobilization, the most common is post-surgical. We just had a guy in a couple days ago. He's got some kind of neurologic stuff. He's been laying around for four or five days, so what do you got? He's got clots. Congestive heart failure, things aren't moving. Stroke, why are you not moving? Increased blood viscosity. We talked about that. Shock, small obstructive thrombi, varicose veins, post-code, post-trauma, okay? Any of those things are out there. So where do clots begin? Clots begin in the cusps of the venous valves and the sinuses of the calf muscle, and they propagate and or embolize. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a second, okay? So that's a little diagram that shows these cusps. Now, what's interesting physiologically about these cusps and back in here is that the lining of all of our blood vessels, veins and arteries, makes PPA, okay, the endothelial wall, all right? So it's kind of nature's own way to help us to uh, not have clots. However, there's a deficiency of endothelium in here, number one. Number two, there's turbulent flow. So turbulent flow, lack of endothelium, put those other risk factors in the recipe, and boom, you've got a good reason to have DVT. So, and this kind of illustrates, all right, lack of endothelium back here, turbulent flow. So that's where DVT likes to begin and rear at times. So distribution of thrombi. 10%, less than 10% of DVT is isolated in calf veins. Calf vein DVT is less symptomatic, less likely to cause PE. And I can't stress this too much. One of the things I do around the edges is, uh, is defense work. And I was actually involved in a case where the person who read the ultrasound said, you know, this is just calf vein DVT, but why don't you check another one in 7 to 10 days and make sure it doesn't propagate. That didn't happen. The patient got a PE and died, and somebody got sued, okay? So... When I was in family practice, oh, caffeine, DVT, no big deal. Give you some ibuprofen, warm moist packs, keep it moving, keep it rolling. You know, now probably a lot of check, okay, because 20% of the people are going to have trouble with this eventually, all right? This is the one we do want to talk about. Now, there's very, the, the only veins in our body that can stack up enough clot to kill us are our femoral veins, our iliac veins, and the IVT, okay? Those are the only ones that can really have enough that can kill us. How about arm veins? Not enough to kill us, okay? And killing us is what we're wanting to prevent, okay? So source of PE, proximal DVT, more common than distal, 40% lead to PE, okay? And we're going to come back to that in just a minute. What are the clinical findings of DVT? You know, pain, tenderness, calf, edema, dilated superficial veins, warm, discolored skin, chest pain, coughing up blood. That sounds like PE, but remember it's all the same disease. Shortness of breath, yes, okay? So... See a big swollen leg, if you see especially a unilateral big swollen leg, the only way you can do that is outflow obstruction. You have to block up either the femoral vein and the great saphenous vein or the common femoral vein or the, the blood can't get out of the leg. And this is what we call a pre-flood maser flow. This person had such severe outflow obstruction, such severe swelling, the compartment syndrome is squishing off the arteries and they're about to lose their leg. These are the people that we need to see immediately. This is emergency, okay? So people with DVT and leg swelling, call us up. We're your helpers, okay? Diagnosis. DVT and PE are the same thing. I talked about that. PE may be the presenting sign of DVT. The bedside diagnosis is difficult. Correct is only, correct is only correct 50% of the time. 40 to 50% with DVT have asymptomatic PE. Now, back when I was growing up, the way we diagnosed PE is pulmonary angiograms and BQ scans. And I'm going to tell you why we hate BQ scans here in a minute, okay? Even in those days, if you gave 100 pulmonary angiograms to 100 interventional radiologists, you'd maybe have agreement 70% of the time, especially once you got beyond the uh, second, third order vessel. Nowadays with CT, we can see second, third order vessels. We can see way out there, all right? So we can see PE better now, since it's a three-dimensional study, than we ever did before. But what's one of the caveats here? I can have a PE right now and clear it within 24 hours, all right? So that patient
patient of yours who came in with chest pain on Friday, and the first thing they do is you check their cardiac enzymes, and that's no big deal. Next thing you know, you send it to David James, and he scopes and he says, that's no big deal. And he says, well, maybe that a PE. Maybe I should do a CT pulmonary angiogram. Too late, it's Monday morning, okay? Remember, you can clear it in 24 hours, right? And that's really, really important, all right? Uh, and we'll talk about ways to evaluate that, all right? So, and that's just where we're at, you know, scan open internal medicine, all right? Performance, we're going to look at four decision-making tools and see how they work and see how they agree here, okay? One is called the Wells Rule. And if you notice, they're very close to each other, okay? You know, what's the heart rate? I got a call from ER last week. This guy came in, he was huge, 550, 60 pounds, got sent in from one of the Mercy hospitals, and he had a cold leg. Well, the ER calls me and says, man, this guy's packing 120, 130, his lips are purple, his fingers are purple. You think he could have a PE? We did a CT pulmonary angiogram, thought he could. Okay, so, you know, people don't always think about that stuff. He was obese, all right, that was certainly a risk factor. Um, and let's talk a little bit about obesity. In women, about 3% of a woman's estrogen in a normal woman comes from conversion in peripheral fat. When, a, when, when, when we're big, we make lots more estrogen. So remember we talked about big women, you know, they have more estrogen-related disease, you know, gallbladder disease, breast cancer, ovarian disease, things that, that, that excess estrogen cause, right? So think about that as, as part of what goes on. Anyhow, um, but if you look at, look at what they're looking at here, and my pointer isn't working so good, they're all looking at similar things, okay? Heart rate, um, you know, the, the risk factors we've talked about, all right? So what you do is you calculate up, you know, risky or not risky, but the most important thing you do is you add in a D-dimer, all right? If your D-dimer is negative, your chance of PE and DVT is 0.5%. There's nothing in medicine that good, okay? Nothing, all right? So all of these rules you put together in your brain box, what you think your risk factors are, and if your D-dimer is negative, look at these sensitivities and negative predictive values, 99, 99, up to 99 points. Incredibly reliable, very useful. Why is that? We shouldn't do unnecessary CT pulmonary angiograms because it's excess radiation. Now, if you're gonna get killed because you got a PE, it's very worthwhile, okay? But examine the patient first. That's really where we're coming from. Examine the patient, all right? Use one of these clinical decision-making tools. And this is the Wells rule. You know how to do all this, all right? And if anybody wants this, I'll give it to them and send it to them, all right? So what are the tests? Color Doppler imaging with venous compression? Absolutely, okay? That's where we all start. Now, one of the problems I have with myself and my radiology colleagues is when the, and the ultrasound technologists, now here we do a little better job than other places, is, now I actually started in family medicine in 1980, which is when the first article came out in the New England Journal of Medicine about using ultrasound to diagnose DVT. And in that very first article, what they did is took an ultrasound probe, pressed on a common femoral vein. If it pressed all the way shut, you didn't have DVT. If it didn't press all the way shut, you had DVT. And their, their sensitivities were up in the 80% range. I mean, they were off the wall. Nowadays, we've taken that, and that's what we do. We compress the vein all the way up and down. But the beef I have is acute clot is what we call hypoechoic. It's black. It's expansile. It expands the vein. Old clot is echogenic. It's bright on ultrasound. It contracts the vein and makes it thick. Well, if, if we don't share that information when that person comes to the ER or with the family pre practice of medicine, if we don't say, this really kind of looks chronic or this looks, you know, new, that's very useful information. Now, on the, on the clinical, clinical side, that D-dimer is really useful. Person comes in with leg pain, they have a history of DVT, D-dimer, stone cold normal, that ain't DVT. And what's the problem? Because these people come in all the time. They've had a bazillion episodes of DVT, every time their leg hurts for whatever reason, they're popping in the ER and we're trying to decide what do we do. Useful tool. D-dimer and ask the ultrasound people, does this look like old or new? Okay, pretty important. Uh, the other thing, we don't do this very much anymore. We only use this as part of treatment. Now let me tell you why I hate these people. Okay, For you medicine people, you can help me with it. I mean radiology. If I remember right, about 5 or 10% of scans are negative, 
about 5 or 10% of the scans are grossly positive, and all the rest, you don't know what the hell's going on, okay? And, and that's part of the problem with DQ scans. So if you start out with somebody with COPD, that's an indeterminate scan before you even start it, all right? So you've wasted four to six hours trying to figure out if this person has a big PE or not, all right? If they have a massive PE, you've got a high index of suspicion. But really what you want to know, have they had any? You want a negative study. So that's why we do CTs whenever possible, okay? Uh, and we can also do MR angiograms as well. Pulmonary angiography, only in the setting where we can't figure out what's going on. That might be some. Um, we've done several this last week. Not so much to look for big PE because I'm looking for chronic PE. I'm looking for signs of pulmonary artery hypertension in people that have like massive swelling in their legs. I'm looking for what I call backward failure, okay? Uh, because I do, I'm do, i involved in the bleeding swirl. So we do some. D-dimer, we talked about. Accutex was a nuclear medicine study we used to do. It was very sensitive for uh, thrombus. The problem with the nuclear medicine world is it takes a long time. And, and, and I'll, we'll talk about treatment in just a minute. Treatment, CAFE, DVT, we talked about that. Most venous thrombotic body disease sign arm are in the lung. Hospital is in which we do in the United States. Hospitalization, heparinoids, warfarin versus factor 10 inhibitor, uh, rivaroxaban has that indication, other factor 10 inhibitors are working on them. Um, for ileal femoral DVT, remember the person with the swollen leg, or deep central vein, arm, or massive clot in the lung, catheter directed thrombolytic clot busting drug. So if you have a simple DVT, it's easy, all right? Now if you're in Europe, what happens to you? In Europe, they don't put you in the hospital, okay? You get 90 milligrams of TPA, and they start you on a thrombin inhibitor like Xarelto, okay? They keep you out of the hospital. And guess what? They have less post-thrombotic syndrome, less pulmonary hypertension than we do. Well, think about it. What's that risk factor for venous thrombolytic disease? It's safety. What do we do? We put them in the hospital, put them to bed. Think about that for a minute. Now, you'll see on our orders out of IR, if we're putting them into bed, we're putting SCDs on them, okay? We're wanting to keep that blood moving. It's really important. So uh, toy with that just a little bit. What's the sequela of bad DVT? Short-term extension and or pulmonary embolism. Long-term, those clots chew up all the valves inside of there. When you lose your valves and you stand up, all the weight of the blood from your head, where's it centered? Right around your ankles and your toes, okay? Because there are no valves to keep it from refluxing. So valvular insufficiency, outflow obstruction, resulting in a post-thrombotic syndrome. What is, what's the pathophysiology? Thrombus propagation from coccyphalus iliofemoral veins, IVC, total venous occlusion causes valve destruction, outflow obstruction, they have venous hypertension, and you all see it. You know, they have edema in the skin and muscles, venal siderin deposition, especially when it's been going on a while, venous ulcers, and as many people lose their limbs from venous ulcers as they do from arterial ulcers. And in fact, some of our literature is now saying 80% of the people that have a wound on their leg have a venous component in it. Most of the time, they're going to ask that question. So this is what really bad post-thrombotic syndrome and venous ulcers look like. Actually, we get to see quite a few of these. Uh, the wound center downstairs uh, sends them to us. And I don't care what you, what skin grafts, what you do to these wounds, they are never going to heal until you deal with their venous hypertension, okay? You can't have venous wounds unless your venous pressures are greater than 30. Normal, zero to five, all right? So uh, I, I see a lot of people that get sent in from, it seems like every, now I was in a 19-bed hospital, so I can criticize them. Every little 19-bed hospital's got a wound center. Somebody puts goo on wounds, makes them some money, all right? And I get these people in, oh, it's taken me two years, I haven't healed, what's wrong? And we haven't asked the right questions, okay? And one of the questions is venous disease, arterial disease, diabetes, that type of stuff. So, uh, wounds, especially that don't heal within a couple of weeks, you got to ask questions on that. Post-thrombotic syndrome. It's common. Six to seven million people have venous basal skin changes. Half million present DVT patients have ulcers. About 5% of the U.S. population is affected. Now, remember I told you about this slide? Well, guess what? We're doing a lot better on this one. So this one's bumped up a notch, all right? So uh, venous thromboembolic disease, PE, kills 400 people a day. Okay, it's now the number three medical cause of death, all right? So it's something that those of us in the medical world need to have a really high index of suspicion for 
And then especially in the really sick people, what can we do to help them? And that's important. 140,000 to 200,000 die per year. 10% die in the first hour. This is really important. Remember I talked about that person who came in on Friday evening and they got their cardiac workup and then their GI workup and then they're worried about this, okay? Of the one-third, one-third only that are correctly diagnosed initially and treated rapidly, there's 8% mortality. If you can get them thoroughly anticoagulated in the first 12 to 24 hours, your mortality rate drops immensely, okay? Super important. Delayed diagnosis, remember that person on Monday morning, 30% mortality. So what are the treatments for life-threatening injuries? Surgery, 25 to 40% mortality. Well, actually, that isn't bad because they'd all be dead. Thrombolysis may require 24 to 48 hour infusions for seven devices. We'll talk about that. Uh, the things that we do downstairs involve catheter and electrum, and we do want to talk a little bit about that. What is a life-threatening PV? Okay, and let's talk a little bit about that. That's a person that has an oxygen requirement. That's a person that's potentially hypotensive. That's a person that has an echo that shows right heart strain. That's a person that when they have their CT pulmonary angiogram, the interventricular septum bows into the left ventricle, which it's supposed to do. When there's signs of really high pressure out there, those are all signs that person's pretty sick, but it's a clinical diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. If your patient is sick, then we need to think about pathogenic therapy. If that patient has compromised lung function, compromised heart function, and they've still got residual thr uh, thrombus in their legs or potential for pain, that's a person we need to, we need to be aggressive with, okay? Oops, skipped one. All right, uh, these are different kind of tools, and our tools change pretty rapidly. Uh, we're just gonna blast through them pretty quick, so you know there's a lot of different kind of tools. This is called the trellis system. I'll show you how it works. Uh, most of the way we do this is we access the popliteal veins behind the knee. What this thing is, it's got two little balloons on it, and there's 20 centimeters in here. You inflate the balloons, put in some CPA, turn on a motor. This is like an agitator. It chops up a clot. You suck it out, and then you pull it down and get another 20 centimeters. We don't use that anymore. Uh, but that's it. Okay? It is what it is. And some people use it. This is what we use here, pulse brake catheter. Okay? I tell the patients, think of it as baby soaker hose, right? Except you're cheap. Okay? The way they build this thing is they take a laser, and they cut little slits in the thing. Okay? And we hook it up to a pump, and the pressure inside that catheter gets to 760 PSI. Those slits open up, and it's like power washing your car. We're actually power washing the, uh, the CPA into the clot, and it's a very effective tool in thrombolysis. So those of you that work in the unit, you take all of our nice patients, and you send them up after a pulse break catheter. That's what's in them, and that's what happens, okay? And they come in different lengths. Uh, it just shows pressure response out there, so I shows how it works, but that's basically how it works, okay? This is another tool we use. It's called the angiojet. Think of a baby vacuum cleaner on the end of a catheter. How does it work? If you ever took a funnel and you put it under water and you pour the water at a high pressure into the funnel, it creates a vacuum around that funnel and it'll suck stuff out. That's called the Bernoulli function, okay? So that's how it works, all right? Um, and it's hooked up to a pump that's outside the patient and we squirt saline in real fast, okay? It happens to be the sound. It creates a low pressure zone, and it sucks out clots. So as an example, somebody comes in, they've got massive DVT. You can't anticoagulate them. They've got a big swollen leg. We can't give them CPA, but someone can do it, okay? So there's tools we can use, but we can't anticoagulate them. And we use the engine. Now, it works really good on, on fresh clots. It won't work in burns on old clots, okay? And that shows some of the stuff that's going on there. ECOS is coming on strong. We've actually used that in the past. That's ultrasound accelerated thrombolysis, and we give them through a catheter, and that's a machine. We'll talk about how it works. Basically, it's a catheter, all right, right here, and they put an ultrasound wire in there, and these are little ultrasound transducers, and they put in ultrasound at a very low frequency. Think of vibration, right? And what it does, it vibrates the clot and makes it absorb the CPA better. And this has recently been approved by the FDA for treating PV, okay? Um, it's been approved in the past for treating clots other places, right? Now, we used it for a while. Um, one of the problems we've had with it, especially in elderly patients and VHS patients, it has a coolant in it, and you have to run saline at about 60 to 90 cc's an hour to do that to keep it from cool. And if you get into fluid volume problems, overloads, you 
that's where we run into trouble. Where we don't have that with the full straight process is it runs about 52 feet an hour. Most people can tolerate 52 feet an hour. Uh, for young people and other people that don't have troubles with those kind of volumes, it's not a problem. Okay? And it may come back to them, but they use it at most of the other facilities. Um, prevention of PD use, uh, low molecular weight heparin versus uh, Xarelco. Uh, you know, the best thing to do is prevent it. All right? Filters, we're going to talk a little bit about those. Everybody, you know, we hear the word, need a green field. It's kind of like Kleenex, okay? Green field equals filter, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Because there's about 14 or 15 different kind of uh, retrievable filters out there now, and they are not the same as the old clean seal, not removable green field filter. And then I want to talk about this one because it's a really new one. It's a very different design, and I want to talk about the problems with this one too. So who needs a filter? First of all, I think we put in way too many. It's not a good thing to do to put more filters. So what's the reason to put them in? Contraindication of anticoagulation, recurrence being either plasmatic set anticoagulation, complications, I'm bleeding, okay, and I can't use anticoagulation, prophylaxis against PD, I got a lot of clot left in my leg. If I have another little bit of clot, I may die. Septic thromboembolism, adjunct thrombolectomy, severe lung and heart disease. We'll talk about those quickly. Those are the classic indications. Now, like everything else in medicine, those are the classic indications. So if Dr. Thom, Dr. Cook, somebody else calls me up, we have a conversation, it makes good sense, that's a different story, okay? Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Implantation technique. Now, at one time I was out at this hospital, um, there's lots of specialists that put in filters. It used to be the vascular surgeons had to put them all in because the sheath was bigger than the thumb and they had to do cut downs. Then they got smaller, then interventional radiologists started putting them in, and then some other kind of specialists started putting them in. So I was sitting across this table from this other kind of specialist, so I won't say what kind he was, and he said, any monkey can put in an IVC filter. And I said, you're right, but any monkey can't tell me there's 20% of the people who don't have normal anatomy of their cava. It's really important, okay, because 20% of the population does not have normal uh, caval um, anatomy, duplicated cavas, multiple renal veins. There's a lot of abnormalities, and that's important to know before you plug a filter, okay? So that's a classic green field kind of filter. Uh, that's something you see called a junction tulip. Now, most filters on the market are a lot like this, okay? They're conical shaped things. They got little struts and legs. They got little hooks on them right down here that keep them from moving around, supposedly, although there's one on the market that's uh, been doing embolizing of the heart and the lungs. We won't talk about that one. Um, but anyhow, and they got a little hook on them so that when you don't need it anymore, six, eight, 12 weeks down the road maybe, you can take it out, and that's really important because part of the problem is about 80% of the filters that get put in never get taken out, and they shouldn't be, okay? If you don't have ongoing risk factors, if you can't hold a sample or something um, that makes you continue to need it, you need to get it out. Why is that? Because 30% of the people who have filters are going to have problems, okay? So what are some of those, all right? And I'm talking about the conical filters. Migration up the cava into the heart, pulmonary, and arteries. Strut perforations into the bowel, verbal body, the aorta, surrounding structures. We took one out yesterday. It was in a verbal body, and it was sticking in the aorta. It was all over the place. Had been put in four years ago. Strut fractures. 3.7% fatal PD with filter in place. Now, does a filter keep you from having a PD? Nope. Keeps you from having a lethal PD, okay? Because all of these things have to let blood flow get through them. So it keeps you from having the big blood clot. And I see some folks who have chronic microembolic disease and pulmonary hypertension for that. Those are people that we actually do pulmonary angiograms on. These are people that are short of breath with short, you know, with short distance walking and they don't have cardiac disease. So um, if you think a filter is going to protect you from everything, you're wrong, okay? Uh, cable thrombosis, we worked on a guy here a week or so ago. He had the filters put in four or five years ago. He clotted through the filter down both legs. He spent all week and it didn't open, so we had to go back. So this is an alternative to those conical filters. All right, start this around, guys, okay? They're going to pass this thing around. Well, how is it different than all the others? Well, it don't have struts. There ain't anything they can poke out, all right, number one. Number two, it's self-centric. So it's a double helix, all right? This upper helix goes north. This bottom helix stays south in the IVC, all right? And that's, that's what it's all about. So they'll pass that around. Um, I try to use it whenever I can. 
Uh, we're about to become a trial um, for this filter that's mounted on uh, intervascular ultrasound catheters so that if a person is really sick, we can go right to the unit and place it in the unit without having to bring the patient down to IR. It doesn't require imaging because we can do the itis and see what things look like and then deploy the filter right off the IV. So we're looking forward to being on this trial, all right? So remember those problems you had with those other ones? There's no tilt. You can capture it either direction. The tissue measures are optimized. They plot the tech they plot the fat plot. And it, it, it's pretty easy, you know, it goes in relatively easy. It's easy to capture and that also helps out with the tissue measures. All right. Now we're going to back away from that. Heparin, thrombin inhibitors, and warfarin do not dissolve clots. All right. All they do is prevent propagation. Remember I said the lining of our veins and arteries make PPA. So what we want to do, what we have done classically when we treat people with venous thrombolytic disease, we keep, keep them from making new clots while we wait, wait for our own body's thrombolytic mechanism to deal with it. That's the way we've always done it. All right? However, if you have outflow obstruction, remember we talked about that, okay? Uh, iliac vein, common femoral vein, they don't work. Okay, and that's where we're going to talk about that, okay? We're going to talk about catheter-directed therapy for symptomatic. What does symptomatic mean? I've got a swollen leg. I have a swollen leg. Why would we want to do that? Well, we don't want them to have a PE. We don't want them to have the post-thrombotic syndrome. All right? We want to decrease morbidity. We want to preserve human trial function. Now, back in 1977, if, if, if you have dealt with people that have chronic DVT, they're always talking. They're always in your office. They're always in the ER. They're always having leg pain, and they're always worried they have a new DVT. Okay? And in 1977, over a 10-year period of time, it cost $150,000. Today, it's probably closer to $300,000, all right? So if we spend $25,000 up front to keep that from happening, I would think, if I was a healthcare system, that would be a bargain, okay? How about days of work lost? How about all those kind of things, other, other benefits, right? Those are huge. So how do we do it, all right? Now, we put the stuff right in the clot. We talked about some of the tools we use, all right? Um, the goal is get rid of the thrombus. Now, are we after to try to get all the clots out of the femoral vein? No. What I tell patients is if the bathtub is full of water, all we want to do is open the drain, let the water out. Same thing here. We want to open those iliac veins. We want to open the common femoral vein. We want to get the blood out of the leg. It's, if we do that, the patient will get better. Okay, and that's, that's what we're really after. We maintain anticoagulation. That's the, the constant that we do that. Contraindication. Uh, risk benefit ratios, contra you know, if you're already bleeding, then now we, we have troubles. We can use angiojet, get stuff open. Bleeding disorders, pregnancy. I did a girl that was one day post uh, delivery, isolated intravenular DVT, active medicine. Now, this is a big deal. If you have known active uh, breast cancer uh, in the brain, you can bleed, okay, and that's a problem. Now, if you've had radiation therapy, it's treated. We do an MR or a CT with contrast, and it doesn't enhance, it's not a problem. Okay? That's pretty important. Um, hemorrhagic TVA within the last year, recent surgery. One of the first thrombolytic cases we did for this patient, and I remember the old surgeon's name, great hair, helped me hold the guys um, about my build. And he, anyway, I'll make a long story short. The guy had had ventral hernias repaired. He had an IPT filter. We clotted down both legs. Two days post-op, we, we were able to treat him. And how can we get by with that, all right? If you have a heart attack or stroke, you get 90 milligrams of PPA. We put 4 milligrams in a 500 cc bag, and we run it in over 8 hours. It's, home, it's almost homeopathic. Why does it work? Because we put it right where the clot is, okay? And that's the key. So technically, we don't get systemic morbidity, all right? But now we make believe we do, and we treat them like we do it. Heparin, heparinoid, factor 10 inhibitor, warfarin treatment. 40% uh, of the people that have that as a class of treatment propagate clot on a therapeutic basis of anticoagulants, all right? Um, anticoagulants don't resolve fascist, and I think this is important. 95% of the people treated uh, who have aliphemoral DVT, heparin alone, have severe valve inhibitors and outflow obstruction. Uh, how do we do it? APT, check them out, think about the whole human being access the popliteal vein, put up our catheter, uh, put the FTDs. And I really think anybody that has a DVT 
we got to keep. Remember I said cases? What do they do in Europe? So I, I, I use SVDs all the time. Uh, check progress every day. Once there's good outflow, fix them at time. Now, one of the things we're on here is a trial we took. Um, it's called the Silver Vena Vena Scent Trial. All the scents that we use in Ariac Range are really designed to be put in the biliary system. We're on a trial for the first one that will be FDA approved. However, the FDA will not let us use it on anybody that's had a DVT. So we're still doing the old way here. And I asked Cook, I said, once the trial is finished, and why do they do that? This is FDA. Nobody's going to spend $400 million to run a device through the FDA if it's going to fail. So the company takes zero risk. The only people that can be in our trial are those that have iliac vein compression for one reason or another, and no disease in their legs and no disease in their cases. So but we're on the trial, and we're the second or third or fourth one rolling. But anyhow, I asked Cook, all right, once we're done with the trial, how long optimally before we get the, four, the, the scent to the four-year minimum? I said, don't take it to get to the end of the FDA approval. Um, Follow-up clinical exam, ultrasound. And I'm involved in doing these ultrasounds because I asked those questions I proposed earlier. Acute clots, old clots, chronic clots make a big difference. I do a lot of denials. Lytic to iliofemoral DVT, 66% will be asymptomatic versus what I'll call anticoagulation alone, which is a big deal. 3% PE versus 16%. 7% rehospitalized versus this is where the money is spent, okay? Let's avoid that. Lytic for iliofemoral DVT, complete life is 72%. And this is really our goal, 85% resolution of acute leg edema and pain. If we cure 85% of pneumonias, we're happy. If we can get 85% of our legs better, we're happy. Okay? Catheter-directed therapy works best with acute thrombus, less than a month old. If there's chronic thrombus, scarring, web-like strictures in the veins, may require PPA thinning. Just so we came up here, we were doing one of those. Okay? But the story is angiographically, venographically, you can't tell. If you push a wire across it and it goes like butter, that's brush clot. If it's really hard, that's chronic clot. Do we back off from any of these? No, we don't. Okay. So what's the future? The future is what's the time to be right here. Better education in the medical community and patients on the indications for catheter-based treatment of venous thromboembolic disease. If there's leg swelling and edema, think of it. All right. And here's one of the problems with ultrasounds. The ultrasound techs really only see from the hip down. If you have iliac obstruction, you'll never see it. So if you've got a patient with leg swelling and you hear, I see clot in a common femoral vein, you don't know if they got clot on there. So in that setting, what I recommend is a CT pulmonary angiogram followed by a CT venogram knees to the heart. In about 45 seconds, you're going to get all the information you need. Do I have a PE? Do I have an outflow obstruction? When you call us up, we know what to do. Okay. Now, if you're not sure what to do, call us up anyhow because we'll take the ball and roll for you. Okay. Um, and, and that's really what our job is. The other thing that's happening, CT does give a lot of radiation. Um, and yes, we are interested in avoiding unnecessary cancers, but that's tiny compared to death from CT. Okay, so the risk-benefit ratio. The other thing is, in the CT world, technologically-wise, they're getting better and better at decreasing the risk. In fact, I saw an article the other day, coronary CTAs were less dose in a CT setting. I don't know how that goes down. It's a big decrease in the risk. Anyhow, thank you. Any questions? All right, I have some more dirt. Somebody has their other crutch pulled for